All right. Uh, greetings, everybody. I'm Larry Williams, the director of CARM, the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis at the Rawls College of Business of Texas Tech. It is February 14th, so let me wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day and say that we're delighted that you can uh, join us today for this Karma Quick Chat. And today we're going to be talking with Andrew Knight, uh, leading up to uh, giving some information about his upcoming webcast. That webcast is scheduled for March 3rd, so a little under three weeks. Uh, it's available live to people who are at um, Karma member schools. Uh, as well as all of our affiliate programs. We make our recording available in the video library. Uh, you can find information on our Karma uh, website, karma.ttu.com. And uh, so we hope that that's something that's uh, of interest. So we're very excited. Uh, Andrew has participated in Karma panels before, but this is his first webcast. You may know Andrew is a professor at Washington University, where he's Vice Dean for Education and Globalization. He's also been Associate Editor of AMJ. He's well known for his substantive work and virtual work, collaborations and relationship, but also does some very cool stuff in the area of research methods. Uh, and uh, we'll have him talk a little bit about that at the end. So Andrew, uh, thanks for uh, fitting our Karma webcast into your schedule and for taking the time to chat a little bit. Thanks for having me, Larry. Yep. So um, I noticed from your background uh, that like a lot of people that end up uh, in management within business schools, they started out from psychology. And so you had some degrees in psychology before you made your transition. How did that transition come about for you? Well, you know, it's a it's actually not a very informative uh, transition substantively. But if I were a doctoral student uh, and actually when I talk with doctoral students, I share this often is that uh, when you're looking at different programs, um, it's always wise to think that someone in your program might move one day. Uh, yeah. And so that was the case for me. Um, my advisor, Catherine Klein, was hired um, from the University of Maryland by yeah. uh, the Wharton School. And so she uh, she was kind enough to continue advising me, and uh, I went along for the journey and the trip north to Philadelphia. Yeah, well, um, I didn't realize that Catherine was your advisor. You know, when Karma was back at Virginia Commonwealth, we had great relationships uh, with the psychology and the management people up at uh, Maryland, including Catherine and uh -huh. Paul Hanges and Susan Taylor, and it goes on and on. So... Uh, well, we were, we were definitely a pro. So when I joined the University of Maryland, um, it was uh, Ben Schneider, Catherine yeah. Klein, Michelle Gelfand, uh, and uh, and Paul Hanges and Rob Ployhart had just left, I believe, yeah. the year before. And so yeah. then in the subsequent year, Ben retired and Catherine was hired by Wharton. And so it was a, a period of transformation, but it was definitely for me. Um, the University of Maryland was imprinting for me as a doctoral student, both in, I think, theoretically, the way I think about organizations, but also methodologically and the importance of good, uh, rigorous methods. Yeah. Well, Michelle, uh, Michelle and Paul were also Karma, have been Karma webcast presenters. So, um, so well, you made the transition. Now you're at WashU. And one of the things I noticed was that you teach uh, the research methods doctoral courses like a lot of us do. And I find that the people I talk to often have, if with any course, but particularly with methods courses, some particular topic that they always look forward to, that they think they do a particularly good job with. So is there some topic like that for you in your methods course? Well, I'd say there's a topic that I enjoy, but I'm not sure I do a particularly good job with yeah. it. Uh, and that topic is measurement. Um, uh -huh. I think over the years, I've really, really, really um, come to love uh, the theoretical side of, of measurement and the challenges of good measurement and the importance of good measurement. Um, and, uh, and I would say it's the piece for me that almost becomes philosophical as you're grappling with what's real in the, in the universe, mm -hmm. what's real in the world and what are the ways that, 
uh, that we try to record or capture that. And so mm -hmm. um, on the doctoral side, it's it's certainly a, a big part of my methods course that I love and I love uh, I love uh, learning from students about that as well. And then I actually created an MBA course called People Metrics uh, mm -hmm. that brings it into that classroom as well. And I think that process of trying to uh, to teach measurement within an MBA course uh, has been helpful for thinking about how to teach it on the doctoral side in new ways as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, once you've been in the profession in a while, and you have the opportunity to look back. You look back and say, God, remember when it was just all. And one of those for me is like paper and pencil questionnaires, you know, and now the the, the best part about teaching measurement is we have so many new data collection uh, te techniques driven by technology. And of course, I know that's the big area for you. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, I think I've been fascinated with um using new technologies for capturing um, behavior interactions, um, for capturing uh, uh, changes over time uh, that stemmed from my dissertation work that was a longitudinal study of teams and how, uh, you know, I collected survey data from teams at multiple points in time and no surprise, uh, people would always respond, why are you having me fill out the same question over and over yeah. again. And it's, well, I'm trying to figure out if things change. Uh, and then to read the qualitative comments on the survey and see how much I was missing, mm -hmm. uh, simply because I couldn't measure continuously. And so I think my um, most of my efforts in using new technology uh, in my research have stemmed from a desire to get a more continuous record of behaviors and interactions over the course of time than is possible with uh, the typically obtrusive um, uh, uh, measurement approaches that we take, whether it's survey-based or um, or even if it's observation and human coders, uh, or even if it is, you know, interview-based, we're often um, we're often uh, filling data sets with temporal blind spots. And so that's where technology has been, uh, I think, a point of fascination for me. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, um, I'm also very much interested in people's uh, journeys, their evolution uh, as scholars and researchers, as well as teachers. I got a couple of things I want to ask you about related to that. So you've been an associate editor at AMJ. And so I wonder whether you you stop and ever stop and think about how uh, your views about the research process uh, were impacted by that experience. I think the number one, uh, the number one area where serving as an associate editor impacted how I consume research and the kind of research that excites me to either launch myself or join with others as a collaboration is, uh, is I think seeing, you know, the, the core substantive value of, of a paper that makes it, you know, a leap up in terms of its contribution relative to the crowd. You know, there are lots of papers that get submitted that are um, uh, that that I think follow a certain recipe, and uh, and we know the recipe well, and the recipe has lots of critical limitations, and so when you come across something that is you know a, a diamond in either the scale of data that someone's collected or the clarity of the logic that they've put together in their theory. Um, it just stands out and you believe you believe it. There's it's it it uh, it reeks of validity. Mm -hmm. And I think all too often in the social sciences, um, we're straining to we're straining to detect narrow effects mm -hmm. that um, that aren't quite convincing. And so yeah. I think that's the thing that 
you know, reading that volume of papers in that period of time as an editor really, really for me, um, I think shifted my thinking about what I want to spend my time on. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and of course, when you encounter articles for which you make that judgment or you see that potential, they need a lot of help. And and I found that to be one of the most rewarding parts of a, of a, my career was the editorial work where I could help editor help authors do bring all of that into clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I you know really I think a piece of that is um, is sometimes prodding and poking people to do more than just enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes people are thinking, well, to get a paper published, I have to have, it depends on your area, X number of studies, or I have to have a field study and a lab study, and I have to have, um, you know, two uh, survey points in time, and I need a mediator. And so sometimes that just enough thinking is the recipe, and you're looking for the recipe and matching to the prototype of what you see in the in the journals. And that riskier bet is then saying, well, how would I go above and beyond that? What would be the next step? Uh, mm -hmm. What investment could I make into this project to take it, you know, take it to the next level? Um, and uh, and I think that's what I'm always hungry to see because usually that next level means that I believe the finding more and that I believe in its generalizability often more. Um, I have more confidence in the work that's been done. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that editorial experience would be one thing that's uh, that's impacted you, but also just the experience with your own uh, scholarship over the years. How do you think you've changed as a researcher or a writer as a result of the experiences that you've had? Um, I think just writing, uh, you know, writing across multiple projects and getting the wonderful benefit and gift of critical feedback from anonymous reviewers, uh, from wonderful editors uh, who have blessed me with their constructive criticism over the years, from co uh, collaborators and co-authors. And I think what it's shifted for me is, uh, is, is um, looking for in any project that I'm working on, what is the most important number one what is the most important point of the mm -hmm. of the article that it's not about mashing together a laundry list mm -hmm. of arguments in the literature that something addresses but instead what's the new thing what is the new single most important transformative piece yeah. and so uh i think compared to earlier on in my career where I, I couldn't quite grasp that, I think, with as much clarity or as much confidence that something was important and valuable. Um, I feel like I I, uh, I have a little bit more of that confidence now in my judgment around what's uh, what's something to hang my hat on. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the second thing I would say is that um, having a better understanding of how to thread the needle of of genuflecting to the past and the literature of the past and um and going out on a limb with uh you know with what what is unfinished business or what are contradictions or puzzles um i think that's also something that uh that i've changed with over time yeah yeah i think a lot of times for junior authors they get so focused on how many contributions their particular paper can make. And they think that by adding what they perceive to be a third or a fourth or a fifth contribution, that it's that sum that really matters. But I think when they do that, they detract the the attention and the weight from what's those top contributions. And so staying focused on those, I think, Learning to stay focused on those can be one of the important lessons that people learn. Mm -hmm. So, yep. so um, as I mentioned when I introduced you, you've made the transition into some administrative work. Uh, how is it that you're able to balance the administrative work with your uh, keeping up your research program? Well, the truth is, is that I haven't yet. And so, <laughs> you uh, haven't, okay. 
I haven't yet. I'm still climbing the learning curve, I think, on the administrative uh, the administrative work. And so in so in the administrative role I have, I lead our our programs, our academic programs, our degree programs. And so the, you know, to come back to the the, you know, temporality and how things change over time. Um, I'm just now making my way through my first academic cycle. And so I mm. feel like I have an N of one for many of the most important decision points, um, many of the most important um, uh, kind of bundles of activities that occur. And for faculty, think about things like graduation, yeah. course scheduling, um, uh, registration periods. You know, it's a limited, even though it's a year that I have in the role, it's uh an N of one as an academic cycle. And so I feel like I'm still climbing the learning curve and have not yet found a great way to balance out dedicated time for research amidst the administrative uh -huh. responsibilities. But I am hopeful, I am hopeful that, um, uh, you know, as I, uh, as I build my efficiency, I think in the administrative side, um, that that time will come back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're here because of your upcoming Karma webcast. Uh, that's March the 3rd, 11 p.m., uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. And the title is Methods for Collecting and Analyzing Data from Zoom Meetings. Can you give us kind of a preview of what you're going to be talking about? Sure. I'm going to uh, I'm going to share an R package that I built um, called Zoom Group Stats and um, but accompanying that, I've also put together um, a vignette that walks through critical decision points for um, conducting research through Zoom, uh, for example, that mm -hmm. also would apply if you're collecting research through other video-based platforms. And so I'll talk a bit about um, the logistics of collecting data, some of the challenges that come about with um, collecting data through those platforms. And then I'll share some of the tools that are available within this uh, within this package. Things like um, you know sentiment analysis on transcribed speech, uh, uh, computer vision analysis of facial expressions through the video feed, um, and I will share some data that I've collected that aligns multiple measurement streams to give some sense for our earlier conversation um, around uh, around how different measures. Um, how different measures coexist within this uh, within this uh, kind of a medium. Yeah, well, that all sounds uh, extremely interesting. Uh, as I was considering uh, presenters and topics, I was very excited to learn about what you're doing, and I'm going to be very eager to hear what you have to say in a couple of weeks. So, uh, Andrew Knight, Karma Webcast, March 11th, March the 3rd, 11 a.m. Eastern, or we will see you then. Sounds Thanks. great. Thanks very much. Looking forward to it. All righty. Take care. Bye-bye.